Greetings one and all, I'm Red Angel, and it's been a while, hasn't it? Apologies for not putting more content out on a regular basis, but a mixture of IRL and hurricanes decided to delay my schedule a bit. Can't get too much work done when you're under a mandatory evacuation. But I digress. Without further ado, I will answer your questions. Thank you for all these questions you sent me, and I'm going to try to answer as many as I can. Additionally, thank you for your compliments. I wanted to say my thank yous now so I don't pepper them throughout my answers to the point where you want to boil me alive afterwards. With all that out of the way, let's begin, shall we? Soul inquires, what is your favorite flavor of ice cream? That's not fair. There are so many flavors of ice cream. I guess cookies and cream since that's the one I get the most, or at least some variant of it. I just like Oreos and ice cream. Bethany Aleson inquires, what does your name mean? Red Angel means a lot of things. I'm not trying to be cryptic. I picked it for a lot of reasons. I'll give a couple of shorter reasons, though. Red, because it's a nickname I've had most of my life, mostly given by older people in life that I've respected, so I've grown fond of it. Angel, because of my fascination with seraphim-like creatures in general and archangels in general, are a particular area of interest for me. Red as a color has a variety of symbolic meanings like love, passion, anger, and you can come to a variety of conclusions from that if you just use color theory. Not only that, but since red is often a color of passion and intensity, you can say that I deliberately contradict it considering my tone is calm and even overall, yet it doesn't change my passion or intensity for what I'm speaking of, just being a variant of the typical color meaning. My username is also a reference to one of my favorite X-Men characters, Icarus aka Jay Gunthry. I picked the name because it has a variety of meanings to me, and I figured that people would draw their own meaning from it. Who knows, maybe if people start making fan art, they'll try to interpret things symbolically. That'd be quite interesting. What I'm saying is, I overthought my username in order for people to take what they will from it. Wednesday Serial inquires, what do you think makes a good game review versus a less than stellar one? Hmm, that's a tough one since everyone has different standards on what a review should be. I hold myself to an incredibly high standard that I never expect anyone to meet. That said, I do have a certain set of standards that other reviewers should meet. For me, a good game review should cover the basics, like whether a game works or not, if there's any obvious glaring flaws that you'd find by playing for about an hour. For example, bad voice acting, spelling errors, glitches that make you fall through the world unintentionally, stuff like that. That's a pretty basic requirement, but to make it truly stand out, I think you need to point out on how the game works thematically as well. Is there a dissonance between story and gameplay? Does the tone go all over the place unintentionally? Are there aspects of the game that just don't fit in with the game overall? Does the game bring up any sort of message? What might that message be? Are there any notable themes? How did the game's marketing allude to the game itself? How did they play into the game itself? Did they tell the truth? Did they lie? See, for me, you can go with a full-on objective bullet point list. If you do a cut and dry review, then you're doing it right in the most run-of-the-mill way possible. That's something I've done, a lot of people like straightforward reviewing, and if you gain an audience by doing it, more power to you. Personally, I've already spoken with disdain about bullet point lists and game reviews since people consistently freak out about them. I think doing them just doesn't work for this particular audience. I believe reviews should be more than just going down a checkpoint list. You can use one as a basis, I do it, but add something to it, and add a bit of yourself into it. That's a way for you not only to be professional, but to make your reviews personal, giving them a little bit of life. It's why so many game reviewers on YouTube are so similar. They use a formula that they think will lead them to fame and fortune, rather than putting their own words in reviews. The truly stellar reviewers remember to balance the textbook professional style of writing with their own flair, making them a diamond in the rough. They don't just use a bullet point list to tell you whether or not the game checks all the boxes. Their words will paint an image of what playing the game is like to the point where you don't even have to pick up a controller. Peter Stump inquires, How do you feel about Five Nights at Freddy's and Call of Duty? I actually enjoy Five Nights at Freddy's, and while I'm getting annoyed at the overexposure, that doesn't change the games for me. I'm planning on doing some videos about them, so stay tuned for that. As for Call of Duty, I don't have much of an opinion on it. I jokingly poke fun at it just like I do with sports games, but I don't really hate it like some people seem to. It's just not my style of game. I mean, I could do various analyses on the games themselves, but really, COD is a quicker study than I'd like to write about. Low-hanging fruit, if you will. The Game God 7777 inquires, Have you ever heard of the Zero Escape series? The third installment released only a few months ago thanks to a successful fan campaign to get the final part of the story. It's genuinely one of the best stories I've ever seen in a video game, and I would love it if it got more attention. I have. I'd love to play them, and I've actually been trying to get my hands on a copy of the first installment. I heard it may get released on Steam, but don't quote me on that one. Just Another White Kid inquires, what are your thoughts on game design and development programs for college or other academic settings? 
It's certainly a newer field to go in, and one I'd recommend if your passion and skills can meet in the middle, making it a viable career for you. We need more people going into the field, and I think having a college education in game design and development may help gradually shape the landscape of gaming into something progressively better as time goes on. Not that it's not great now, but the more you do, the more you can learn, and then you can share what you've learned with others. Snickety Slice Inquires you talk a lot about indie and less well-known titles. Are there any AAA games that you enjoy and could talk about at length? I'd like to tackle Beyond Good and Evil, the Tomb Raider series, even if that means I have to talk about Angel of Darkness, Dot Hack, Harvest Moon, Bioshock, Stalker, Planescape Torment, and Silent Hill at one point or another. Honestly, there are tons of AAA titles I'd like to talk about more, and I will if people are interested in me talking about them. Sega Clown Boss inquires, one, do you think it's possible to quantify the objective values of a work, such as a game, or that ultimately all impressions we have of them are subjective and individual? Two, what's the best way to preserve or archive games, and do you think piracy is a beneficial solution in that regard? Three, what is one bad trait you would never want other people to copy from you? First one, I think it's only possible to quantify the objective values on an ultimately basic level. Things like functionality, like if the game functioned how it was designed to function, or if you fall through the world. The rest of it, well, to me at least, is subjective and individual in their entirety. I may think that there's tonal dissonance in Bioshock Infinite with a message that ultimately falls flat and takes quite a bit away from the game as a whole, and I agree with the majority of Aaron Signal's video about it, but I know our opinion isn't a popular one if any of the other videos about the game are any indication. Ultimately, the games you like are under your scrutiny, and other than being functionally bad, the rest of it is up to your own subjective and individual values. Second question, I feel as though archiving them digitally is a good way of preserving games, since that gives people the ability to play games on systems that they may not own or games that are so rare they can't get their hands on it. It's one of those times where I think piracy is borderline needed because there are quite a few games that have never been imported to certain countries to the point where you can't get a copy to work without jailbreaking your console, or even to experience a game we may not necessarily like. I may want everyone to play Echo the Dolphin, but I'm not gonna force you to go out, get a Sega Genesis, and buy Echo the Dolphin to hook up to your CRTV that you'll also have to buy in order to play the game how it's meant to be played. Would I like you to? Sure, but I'm not gonna yell at you for not playing the game the way I played it back in the day. You can also have a sort of archive like they've been archiving movies for years in order to preserve them for future generations, which could potentially work if we could get enough historians interested in it. That'd be the ideal solution, but not one that may be viable since game consoles appear to be more testy than movie playing equipment. A digital archive is the best and most legal option to go about it, trying to convert all the copies into a digital format for future playthroughs. However, I know for some games that's just not possible and piracy may be the next best option. Third question, what is one bad trait I'd never want people to copy from me? My obnoxious perfectionism that causes me to take far too long with my videos and my writing. Don't get me wrong, it does make my videos come out with very few technical issues, but it also doesn't keep my audience as enraptured as I'd like. I could have grown a larger audience if I released videos more often, so if there is one thing I could tell future creators not to do, it's not to be too much of a perfectionist. There will always be something to fix, trust me. Aiden Owen Jones inquires, do you think indie games should have their own Game of the Year award, as in many aspects aren't able to compete with AAA games? Yes, there should be separate Game of the Year awards for indie games. When I see traditional reviewers who mostly review AAA titles trying to judge an indie game alongside AAA titles, it just bothers me. More often than not, they just don't know what to make of it, and when they try to judge games that they have no real grasp on, this just reaffirms it to me. There are things that indie games do that don't stack up against AAA games, this much I know. But then there are some things that surpass them in my opinion, it just depends on how you look at games. Caleb Cook inquires, where do you see yourself in five years? Reflection and analysis is often important during one's life. As a published author who owns a log cabin in the woods working on her master's or even her doctorate. Maybe I even have it already. Depends on how quickly I can get the funds to do so. Luciano Bartinoli inquires, what is your take on journalism? Or more specifically, what do you think of independent journalism and the struggles of being one, since you have the job as a journalist yourself? Journalism is easily one of the more difficult jobs to have from an ethical and a moral standpoint. This is the sort of job where even if you want to make your job easier, you can't, because if you do, you could miss something vital and get a fact wrong. Even then, people will accuse you of being biased or paid off no matter whether you're doing a good job or not. Oh, and let's not forget, being an online journalism gives even more people access to your articles, which means people will dogpile on you a lot easier and spew out whatever they want. As an independent journalist, it allows me to go from publication to publication freely, and it's a lot less limiting, so I'm able to say things a lot more freely than I would if I worked for someone like IGN or Kotaku. The problem is the pay isn't as good, and you don't get any of the benefits. 
That and you may not have access to as many games as someone who consistently works for the same company does. It's a big reason why I've been writing reviews on GameSkinny, since affiliating with them gives me more access to games than if I was just an independent writer who wrote her reviews on Tumblr. Pixie Plays inquires, what are some subjects or mechanics you wish more games used? In terms of subject matter, motherhood. I wish it was used in a more positive way with playable characters. I know that probably seems like a very minor thing, but check out Games as Lit's video, Thematic Rarities, Motherhood, to see what I mean. Fatherhood is becoming prominent, especially with the success of games like The Last of Us and The Walking Dead, but motherhood is still considerably rarer. Mechanics-wise, a relatively minor one again, but in the game Transistor, when you're walking around, you're able to press a button and you're able to hum. Since the character Red was a singer, it adds a lot to her character and the environment. I wish more games would implement small mechanical things that you may not necessarily use in battle or the gameplay itself, but add more to the person that you're playing as or the world that you're in. I'm the kind of person who loves little touches in games that make the world seem more alive. Renegade Master inquires, Number one, have you ever been pleasantly surprised with a game or a piece of media? Number two, I noticed you primarily talk about PC games. I was wondering which of the three consoles looked the most interesting to you. I've been pleasantly surprised by media quite a few times, and it just goes to show that you can't judge a book by its cover, creator, or concept. You just have to give it a chance and see what happens. In regards to the consoles, I think the PS4 looks the most interesting to me since it just passed my test of 10 to 15 games I'd want to purchase before purchasing the console test. That said, I'm also looking at the Xbox One because there are a few games I'd want on there, but not enough to warrant a purchase just yet. When it comes to the Nintendo Wii U, I'd have to lower my score overall because I haven't found enough games on there in order to purchase it. What can I say? I'm picky. Blue Knight 85 inquires, when did your interest in journalism start? I've been interested in journalism for a while as a form of writing and giving news to the general population. I like the ideas of trying to keep people informed to what's going on, and I wanted to see if I could do the same thing. Ocean Olacian inquires, have you thought about doing episodes on older games like 80s and 90s type stuff? I would love to see your thoughts on NES and SNES games. I've thought of doing older games from the 80s and 90s, those are good decades for gaming in general, and most games I've played were exclusively arcade games from the 80s since I didn't have a home console. I'd like to do videos on SNES and NES games if enough people showed an interest in them. I'm kind of hesitant though, because a lot of people make videos about those games already. There are a lot of games I could tackle, particularly games like Yoshi's Island, Earthbound, and Chrono Trigger. I was planning on doing a video about the Echo the Dolphin series, since that's one of those weird series that deserves more coverage, so look forward to that in the future. Plast Production inquires, what's your opinion on Undertale? I knew this would come up eventually, especially with a thousand subs. I enjoyed Undertale and there are a lot of things I liked about it. But, like with anything, there are a few things I wish I liked more. I believe that the game peaked at Waterfall, and after that I was more lukewarm to it than I think most people were. I certainly don't think the game is bad, I just wouldn't play it again anytime soon. I find that the fan community has done a lot more for the game than anything else, and has expanded on the characters in a way that the game chose not to. I suppose that's part of the appeal though, since you have a lot more materials you can dig through after the story is over, even if they aren't part of canon. Jake Delph Delphir inquires, you're trapped on a desert island and only three video games to tide you over. What would they be and why? Hmm. Well, since you didn't say anything about not including mods, I'd like to say Skyrim, including all the mods I downloaded for it, Animal Crossing New Leaf, and Beyond Good and Evil. Skyrim, with all the mods, since it gives me a lot more to do within the game and actually makes it into a game I'd have more fun with, Animal Crossing New Leaf in order to sate my need for interaction with others, even if it's going to end up in a castaway Wilson scenario, and Beyond Good and Evil because no matter how many times I play it, it's still one of those games I get fully invested into the story every time. Nera Rooks inquires, I would love to know what some of your favorite games are, or your favorite game if you just have one. I have a few favorites, but my number one is Beyond Good and Evil. The rest of my favorites tend to change around, but Yoshi's Island tends to stay at the top as well. Hagrazy inquires, have you ever considered learning how to make a video game of your own, assuming you haven't already done so? Creating a video game of my own would be amazing for me, and honestly, I know a few people who have done it or are in the process of doing it, like MC Profit, so I'd have great teachers. The Dark Side of the Leaf inquires, what made you want to make videos on games instead of, let's say, writing essays, or even something else? Well, if we're gonna be technical here, I am writing essays. They're just essays about video games that I convert to script form. Frankly, I've been wanting to do videos for a while now, I just wanted to reach a point in my life where I'm at the precipice of my skills as a writer. I'm a terrible perfectionist for some things, and my writing is one of those things. I've thrown out countless drafts to the scripts I've written prior to now, and various versions of stories that I've been writing to try to get published. Now, I feel like I've become confident enough in my abilities as a writer, life experience, and intellect to start sharing my ideas for videos with other people. That, and writing in this format, is great practice for when I save up for my master's degree. Elise Aranai inquires, Would you ever consider playing games like Child of Light or Song of the Deep? They seem to be the style of game that you might enjoy, so I'm curious. 
I've played Child of Light. I haven't finished it yet, but I love Child of Light and I'm going to finish it soon. I've been carefully waiting for Song of the Deep to go on sale so I can snap it up because you're absolutely right, it does look like my style of game. Mercury Inquires, in a lecture I attended, Professor Pietri Lenowski of Sototone University proposed that game mechanics should rigidly enforce behavior which makes sense in a game world. That is, the game only permits your actions that your character would actually do. Now, technical difficulties aside, I think it's virtually impossible to construct such a game. What do you think about that? Should game mechanics limit player freedom to enforce a constant simulation of the game world and your avatar? Should game mechanics at least support the world, the narrative, and the character? Or are game mechanics world character and narrative more or less unrelated. First of all, Sailor Mercury, love your work saving the world. You're my favorite Sailor Senshi slash Scout. In regards to the professor's statement, I've seen game mechanics that do rigidly enforce the behavior into the game world. I'm not sure if you've heard of these developers, but they're called Tale of Tales. They went under semi-recently and they made games that did exactly that. Now, while this did work for the stories that they were trying to tell, it severely limited the audience they had, which is in part what caused their ultimate downfall. For what the professor was talking about, that seems to be a very specific sort of game that doesn't always flourish under the scrutiny of the mainstream audience. Take the game I just did for the gaming symposium, Anatomy. The mechanics involved walking around the house exploring things and playing videotapes. The game is called an alt game which deliberately uses glitches and lack of budget to their advantage into constructing a unique and niche story. Key words being unique and niche which means that these sort of games won't be necessarily for everyone, and the mechanics won't work for every type of game. Games can be deliberately designed with the mechanics, world, and narrative more or less unrelated to one another, but I don't think that it always works. My perspective comes from the AAA, indie, and alt games market here when I'm saying this, but it's ultimately up to the developer and what they choose to design their game like. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but in the end, I think the professor may have a very limited view on what games can be if that's how they view them. Soda Scene inquires, what game made you transition your thinking into games as something to critique rather than just entertainment? If it wasn't a single game, how would you describe the process of starting to think more critically about what you were playing? I feel as though there were three games that started changing my relatively narrow-minded view on games from, it's the thing I do when I've read all the books in the house and there are no good documentaries on, or Sailor Moon, to, okay, this is a form of creative expression that I took for granted before and now I feel ashamed of myself. Those games were Tomb Raider, Silent Hill, and Beyond Good and Evil. I played them all at three different periods in my life, Tomb Raider when I was still very young, Silent Hill when I was around eight or nine, and Beyond Good and Evil when I was 13. Without giving too much away about my childhood self to my audience, let's just say that there was a drastic difference between the Red Angels in those points in time and leave it at that. The Rogue Shadow 75 inquires, what's your favorite ability to use in a video game? I'm going to cheat and say the shape-shifting abilities you can use in World of Warcraft as a druid. I cannot express how much fun it is to be a druid in World of Warcraft. If I can get somewhere fast, I can just turn into a bird. If I want to go stealth, I can just turn into a cat. If I want to be super healthy, I can be a bear or a tree. And if I want to be obnoxious, I can turn into an owl bear. It just makes each form so much fun and gives you all sorts of abilities and makes each gameplay experience more varied and unique than you'd expect. Pixie Play inquires, anything you need help with? Editing? Screen caps? What can your community do to help you? Honestly, just keep commenting on my videos and engaging with the other members of this little community we're building here. If you want to start doing fan art, that's fine. If you want to become friends with other members of the community, that's fine too. I'm working on a Steam curator group, so I guess join that when it's up and running. But other than that, just keep doing what you're doing. Yellow Buizel inquires, I've seen on Twitter that you're a fellow fan of national parks. Which are your favorites, if you've been to any, and is there any particular you want to visit? Well, I live in Florida, and one of the positive things that I can say about this state is that we have wonderful biodiversity. I'm a big fan of the Everglades, I've been there a few times as a camp counselor and it never gets old. There are quite a few state parks I'd recommend, the biggest being Blue Springs, Florida. Go look it up. It's a wonderful place with clear blue water and caves to explore, and wonderful wildlife. Now, outside of Florida, there's this place called Land Between the Lakes in Kentucky. That's a national park, and I went there with my mom and grandma, and it's one of my fondest memories. It's a massive park that has all sorts of wildlife things to see and explore, so if you're going to Kentucky anytime soon, I'd highly recommend it. As for where I'd like to go, I want to go to Yellowstone so bad, you have no idea, and I hope to go someday. The great and humble Avril inquires from her magical kingdom, What's a small, insignificant thing that frustrates you to no end? On the other hand, what's a small, insignificant thing that will always put a big smile on your face? It bothers me to no end when the books are stacked in a way where it shows the pages rather than the spines of the books. As for a small, insignificant thing that puts a smile on my face, the smell of a new book. Depolar Star inquires, what type of game, genre, series, or games from a certain era or subculture you want to get more into? I'd like to get more into racing games. I've enjoyed them before and I'd like to think I can enjoy them now as long as I can find one that's at least more beginner friendly or at least very rusty player friendly. 
Hazel Mage inquires, Okay, so we've seen a lot of indie one-person type setups, bearing a few exceptions. Is there any way you'd consider reviewing an MMO that, while relatively popular, most people still refuse to give it a try due to the misconceptions of the original version of the game? Of course, there might be possible reasons why you can't on the legal side, but I'd like to see a personal view on it. I would consider reviewing an MMO that people refuse to try or what have you. While MMOs aren't my favorite sort of games, I'm willing to give any game at least one try. That, and if I can make it to the end of Last Dogma, I can make it through anything. Kuklug inquires, what books would you recommend to start seeing games a little more critically? Let's see, I have a few in mind, but I should note that there's a lot more out there that I probably haven't read or just read small excerpts of that I didn't feel comfortable enough to make a judgment on as a whole. Here are some that I've read that may be good choices. Console Wars, Sega, Nintendo, and a Battle that Defined a Generation by Blake Harris. Grand Theft Childhood, The Surprising Truth about Violent Video Games and What Parents Can Do by Lawrence Kunther. Getting Gamers, The Psychology of Video Games and Their Impact on the People Who Play Them by Jamie Madigan. Video Games and Education by Harry J. Brown. Now, of this group, I think Video Games and Education is the most well-written and it's the most applicable to what I do here. However, the others have merits and you'll have to just determine those on your own. I'd recommend checking them out at your local library rather than buying them in order to play it safe, since I know these books can be rather polarizing. I hope this helped. Admiral Teddy inquires, What is your biggest passion and goal in life? Getting my novel published, but at the rate I'm going, I may try to get published in a literary journal prior to that. Since I have so many short stories laying around, a couple of quick run-throughs by some editors should shape them up to be at least passable. I could have published it in the magazine I used to run, but I didn't want to do that because I found it dishonest since I was the editor-in-chief. I'd like to not just be a published author, but perhaps a best-selling one and then I can get my doctorate so I can be a professor. That'd be ideal. I've always wanted to help others. That's been my goal since I was a child, and I think educating and informing people is a good way of doing it. And that's the end of the questions. If you've noticed the beautiful art in the video, go check out Captain B's DeviantArt link in the description below. And while I'm here, let me promote my title card artist that you've seen her artwork in a couple of my countdowns. Her name is Avril, and I'll link her DeviantArt as well. Thank you so much for subscribing to my channel. I hope I can continue to give you great quality YouTube videos in the future. I'm Red Angel, signing out.